I'm from IU Bloomington. I'm a major in cognitive science and political science. Um, my presentation today is on Wikipedia and the Knowledge Commons. Um, first, I'll give you a little bit of background about the Knowledge Commons, um, and then we'll jump right in. Um, so Knowledge Commons make vast amounts of information openly accessible, from free data and open source code to entire texts um, and books that are in the public domain. Like natural commons, such as a fishery or grazing land, a Knowledge Commons must coordinate between users so that the resources are maintained over time. Um, this means building mutual expectations between users in the form of social norms. And with Wikipedia, that means building mutual expe expectations among thousands of editors. Wikipedia is a colossal knowledge commons with a detailed record of page creation and link formation that spans more than a decade. It's a rare example of documented and time-stamped norms. What I'd like to do in this presentation is to weave together the quantitative but also narrative account of norm development on Wikipedia. Um, I'll then contextualize some of our findings about this process of norm development in the economic theory of the commons and also the sociological theory of institutions. So to start, there's probably something that you didn't know about Wikipedia, which is that along with the five million articles that are about every topic that you could possibly think of, there's also 2,000 pages in the Wikipedia namespace that are solely norms for editing the encyclopedia. They're sort of policies and rules about how people ought to interact with the content, but also with each other. Um, the norms are extensively documented, again, including the date that it was created and everything that it links to. Um, users can also categorize these. So some of them are policies, while others are essays or humor. Most of the, uh, the norm system is made up of essays that describe um, different aspects of like, the processes of Wikipedia. So with the ones that are categorized as policy and guidelines, we find that they um, grow really quickly from the very beginning of the encyclopedia. Something that's interesting is that when we separate the ones that are categorized as policy and guidelines from the rest, primarily essays, we find that there's a difference based on when the population starts to grow as well. You see policies grow, then the population, which is a little bizarre, and then everything else comes in. How we understand this is that a small group of people, the people who are around in the very beginning of the encyclopedia, are creating the policies which grow later to become some of the most important pages in the, net, in the network. And the essays, which are largely commentary on the policies and tend to surround it structurally, come later as more people come in, see the policies made by a smaller group of people, and begin to adapt them for the rest of the system. So a neutral point of view, for example, is um, one, of, one of Wikipedia's oldest and, uh, as I'll show later, one of its most central norms. A uh, neutral point of view tells users that when they're adding information to the encyclopedia, they should keep it unbiased, they should use sources that um, are reliable in that they don't focus on one side of the argument or, other, or another. Um, in the early days of Wikipedia, it's interesting, this was um, what forced some branching between um, Wikipedia and other knowledge commons um, that we won't discuss here. <laughs> um, but neutral point of view isn't all by itself. Here in the text, you can't read it particularly well, but this says published by reliable sources. And if you click those blue words that we all know so well from Wikipedia, you go straight to verifiability. So in talking about what it means to keep a page neutral, neutral point of view has to reference what it means to have information that's verifiable. And in talking about what it means to have information that's verifiable, verifiability has to talk about not having original research. So some like mad kooky scientist can't come in with his new theory and write an entire article you know, thinking he's changed physics as we know it. And already you can see that we're starting to think about these norms in a network sense. You have neutral point of view, which references verifiability, and in doing so creates a directed edge between the two. So it's, it's um, it's pointing to it in the larger network. This network perspective is really helpful because it allows us to, to quantify the norms, to understand both the global structure and also the ways that they connect to each other locally and influence each other. Um, and we'll use it for the rest of this analysis to really understand the local and global structure of the norm system. One of the algorithms we'll use, you probably use every day and don't even know it, is, that, uh, is PageRank from Google. What PageRank does is it gives us an idea of who's popular in a network by looking not only at the friends of a node, but their friends' friends. And so how popular this guy is is totally dependent on both how many links 
are going in, but also how many links are going into his neighbors. So instead of just saying like, you know, he has 10 neighbors, for example, it's really taking in the entire global structure and the, and the relative importance within that entire structure. So we use a page rank algorithm to calculate a value called eigenvector centrality, which I'll refer to as EC, and that's basically a node's probability of being accessed by a random walker in the network. So if you're just going through, you have a greater chance of ending up here than here, because you might hit the neighbor who's a neighbor of this one, and you'll end up at the um, more central nodes. Using that algorithm, we find out that Wikipedia has a set of core norms. These are the pages that you're most likely to come across navigating randomly, um, and they have the highest centrality. Uh, you'll have to trust me when I say it's a significant difference. These are way more central than any other page in the entire network. Um, and there's about 20 of them, and then it sort of breaks off, and things become um, just generally less central than these core norms. So this starts to get at questions like, do pages all begin equally central? Are these pages are these pages developed halfway through the norm's lifespan? Are they developed early on? When do core norms emerge? And it brings up this question of inequality. And so to, uh, to answer the question of inequality, we use something traditionally used in economics called the Gini coefficient. Usually when you hear somebody talk about the Gini coefficient, you'll hear it with regards to income distribution, with, with regards to wealth. Um, we use it as a measure of the amount of resources, in this case, attention or centrality in the entire network of norms. So just a super quick background is that the Gini coefficient is a number between zero and one, where zero is total equality, 50% of whatever your population is has 50% of whatever your resources are, and then total inequality, which means all of your resources are concentrated in one place. So we take the distribution of eigenvector centrality values based on the links between pages that exist in each month, and we can understand how inequality or equality in the network changes over time. And so this is a graph of the Gini coefficient. What's interesting is that the network starts out unequal. There's never a time where everything in the network is, is pretty equal. Everybody has the same number of links, as you might expect when people from totally different parts of the world, of the country, are putting together this, this network of norms. Just to give you an anchor, a 0.5 um, Gini coefficient is like 0.1 more than the um, income distribution of Indiana, for example, which is not great. Um, and then, you know, 0.4 is about what the U.S. is, which is still relatively unequal. So it's coming in already um, very skewed. So this might make you think then that the core norms are unstoppable. They've been around um, for a while. They're getting more and more popular. They're going to take over. It's actually the case that the core norms have been stable most of this time. Um, from about, by the end of 2004, this is just 10 of them, but by the end of 2004, 75% uh, of the 20 core norms are already established, um, which is only about three years into the entire lifespan up until now of uh, Wikipedia and its norm network. So what that means is that uh, it's not that the core norms are getting more popular, it's that new pages probably aren't garnering the same attention as the older cultural <coughs> policies of the core norms. So rather than it being centralized in one, it's getting centralized in the communities around these. So if we use eigenvector centrality to understand the difference between, say, a core norm and a total peripheral norm, we can understand the difference between core norms via a measure we create called overlap. What overlap does is it um, gives us a way of understanding, the, um, of understanding the common nodes in the peripheral structure of the core, no core norms. So how many nodes will I visit in in steps that link into both in POV and assume good faith? This one's civility and reliable sources, just so you know. Uh, it's very common on Wikipedia to use these, these acronyms. Um, so then what overlap is measuring is if I take 10 steps out in the network from neutral point of view and 10 steps out in, from assume good faith and I'm just walking out randomly, what proportion of the nodes that I encounter will be common between the two? If over time these, these core norms are getting more similar, if they're coming together in some common idea that people are expressing, then you would expect overlap to increase or maybe, maybe even stay the same. But we, what we end up getting is a, a huge decrease in overlap. That's to say that the norms are gradually drawing apart. They're, they have fewer nodes in common. So what you might have seen in 2004 when um, most of the core norms were established would look something like this. 
what you see in 2015 is much more like this, where the, the nodes that are shared between core norms um, are much fewer. So what that's saying is that new nodes, new norms, are more and more centralized on single core norms and are less likely to fuse links between the core norms. So they're not resolving, or they're not finding commonalities between them. Um, and though we don't show it here, it's important to know that the local levels of clustering, the um, number of connections that are made of all possible connections around these core norms, stays the same over time, despite the fact that the actual clusters themselves are decoupling from each other. So when we assemble all of the, these core norms and all of their peripheral norms into one network, we get this. We have the pages linked to each other based on the links based on the links that are in their text, and we get a large, dense network of norms. So what we're interested in once we have this entire network is its emergent structure. So how have people, just by linking when they're making one page or making two pages, no one person has made two, all approximately 2,000 pages, how are individuals, um, how are their actions forming something greater at the global level? Um, the, and the way that we analyze this is using a community detection algor algorithm called the Levan algorithm. And so as you'll see the colors here are kind of a, a teaser for that. Um, and then what we're able to do is once we have it split up like this, th I mean this is exactly what we get to begin with and we don't know what these mean at first. We can then look at those communities and find the central nodes within those communities and then understand what they mean in terms of the common themes that communities have. So it's a little small here, but this big blue chunk is collaboration. It has a norm like assume good faith, which says that while I'm editing, if I encounter something that you're doing that I think is not good for the encyclopedia, I should assume that you have the best interest of the encyclopedia in mind. Article quality, which has things like verifiability, neutral point of view, it really deals with having good sources um, in the encyclopedia. Content policy, which is a little more legal, deals with issues of image use and licensing, copyright, um, and administrators, which is where you get your banning um, and other like very uh, other of the few like very um, like top down actions. And there's a bunch of really like great smaller communities like Wiki LARPing that you can like talk about over coffee or something. They're really fantastic. <laughs> um, so this is a lot really fast, but I'll just go through a couple of conclusions that we have from all of this so far. Um, to begin, the network editing population experienced mass massive growth. The Wikipedia norm network is truly a dynamic system. And policy creation is driven by a relatively small number of people, um, despite democratic associations that people usually have for knowledge commons. This is in line with the Iron Law of Oligarchy, um, which was first theorized in 1915, um, but updated in 2014 to include um, peer production uh, situations such as Wikipedia and other knowledge commons. Um, and that's when somebody, you have a small group of people making decisions um, that come to govern a lot uh, larger group of people. Um, and attention in the network is unequally distributed and becomes less equal over time. Sort of zoom through these. Um, the encyclopedia contains a set of core norms with significantly greater centrality in the network than other pages. And over time, they're becoming more distinct. You have fewer pages uh, uniting them. Um, and that's very possibly them decoupling because of inconsistencies between them. Um, if, uh, if you have one page that possibly has something in common with, it, with another, uh, where you're trying to resolve an inconsistency, you would link them. But the fact that we're not seeing very much of that means that there might be inconsistencies that are driving them apart. Um, and finally, local referencing gives rise to communities with common internal themes. So the actions of individuals at the local scale, scale is having um, a global effect on the overall structure. And finally, some very quick theoretical implications um, and future directions. Uh, in some ways, this opens a lot of questions that we don't have answers to yet, which is, do individuals engage with the norms, or engage with the commons directly through these norms? Um, some work by Eleanor Ostrom um, would say yes, would say that, yeah, users use these norms to coordinate. But on the other hand, if they're not directly governing behavior, are they perhaps serving as myths? things that people might believe that just give legitimacy to the system, even if they're not directly controlling behavior. There's a lot of really great sociological theory by Meyer and Rowan on that same idea. Um, and finally, what's the relationship between the ideological landscape, the overall norm network, and all of the possible ideas that people have created about how that should be governed, with the individual mental representations that people have? 
It's unlikely that any one of us could memorize all 2,000 pages and use them, but if we were to be part of the encyclopedia, which ones and how would we choose them to, in order to write about them or use them um, when interacting with the encyclopedia? So I know I know that's a lot, so I will be taking questions here in just a second. Um, first, I also want to say nobody's born knowing how to do any of this, and I owe a lot of people a lot of gratitude. Um, thank you, Simon Dedeo, for being an awesome mentor, and also to um, NSF and the Santa Fe Institute um, for funding and offering me a place to do research. And finally, the Cox Research Scholarship Program um, and IU STARS have both been wildly influential um, in getting me started on my great research track. So with that, I believe we have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, awesome. Great. Good talk. Could you go back to the conclusion slide? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Over here, uh, did you did you plan to test the uh, the second conclusion that you have, where, where you talk about uh, inconsistencies being the reason for the, <coughs> the Right. So, um, as far as actually testing the inconsistencies, right now it's an element of the theory that we think relates to it. Um, I'm not sure how to operationalize that. To be honest, but I think um, I think we can start to get at that by seeing that there's there um, aren't pages that are like trying to trying to merge them. So are you going to go back uh, on a time series kind of a, a investigation to see if there were some policies that were changed which led to inconsistencies, or right. seeing if they were the same but then people realized their inconsistencies and then they got decoupled? Yeah, that's something that we could do. So seeing if things merged at any point or if yeah. things were split. So it's really uncommon in Wikipedia for um, for things to merge. It's more likely that the page just like right. kind of falls out of use. Right. Um, so we would likely anything that merged we would likely find the better version of it being more central and the like less important version of it getting kind of like left in the dust. So so do you think the decoupling is the evolution of Wikipedia as it is evolving into being more of what it should be? Yeah I well I think it's I think it's um, some ideas really sticking mm -hmm. and ideas that um, a small group of people were very passionate about in the sense that they were very adamant about like making those um, important from the very get-go and that those ideas are becoming more distinct as new people come in recognize the role of that idea in the encyclopedia and then comment on it sort of under the assumption that it's already important. So, so do you think it's a good thing? That it's I happening think it's then? a good thing. Ooh, um, I can't say. Yeah, I I don't know. Probably a content-based analysis of seeing how, how new content uh, is in comparison to older content mm -hmm. would be a way to find out if the evolution is beneficial or not. Yeah, absolutely. It's a but good idea. Excellent work. Thank you. How do you tell whether a page is defining a norm versus just any other article? Yeah, um, so when we when we originally collected the pages, anything that has um, a general policy about how the encyclopedia should operate, we, we consider a norm. It has an understood, this is how it ought to be, um, which is how Eleanor Ostrom defines norms in the um, Grammar of Institutions paper that she wrote. Um, but we get rid of things like um, a list of policies that ha doesn't have actual substance to it. Um, so norm is a broad term for anything that somebody thought ought to be the case in Wikipedia. So did you go through all 2,000 or so by hand? Oh, or? no, so the 2,000 that we look at are once we've already gotten rid of, of lists or anything, or just like general like um, like boxes of information, like what you might see like if you look up like a biography or something. Once we've discluded all of the noise, so to say, uh, it's like 1967 or how many we're left with, and it's all said and done. So that's part of the like, code for actually yeah. spidering and um, getting it off of Wikipedia, is that it's like systematically taken care of. Okay. So the norm pages are actually marked by Wikipedia? Or um, are you looking for specific strings? Or? Right, so they're, they're the pages in that Wikipedia namespace that aren't like, that have an amount, like a substance to them that's not just a list or like an info box or something. Okay. Yeah, I can give you more information about that. Uh, how do you kind of relate this idea of knowledge commons and kind of the structure of that to like, like as you mentioned earlier in the beginning of the talk, like other commons, like natural resource commons? Yeah. Um, so there, there are some um, very big differences in the sense that in a natural resource commons, um, 
you have this idea of subtractability. So my use of a resource directly takes away from your ability to use it. In Knowledge Commons, it's a little different. That subtractability isn't really an issue. When I look up something on Wikipedia, it doesn't directly prohibit anybody else from looking up the same thing. Um, but you still have to have, there's still like an inherent, commons are inherently social, and that's what they'll have in common regardless. Mm -hmm. um, and knowledge commons, because you have people um, who are not interacting face-to-face -face most of the time, trying to create mutual expectations between them, you have to have um, the mutual expectations that you create how do I put this? Um, I would say, right, so I, I can't show that show with this, are uh, a little bit more like explicit. They're not as like space-based as natural commons would be. Like there's there's less of that like personal interaction. So you really have to have these like like records like what Wikipedia has. Um, and they deal with like different issues like content quality, for example, um, and may even have different impacts as far as whether they're directly enforced or more of this like still beneficial institutional myth. Does that yeah. answer your question? Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you.